Hey there, folks. Uh, John here, and this is the False Takes uh, podcast show something, whatever we decide to call it. It's only the second episode. We, like I said, still have time to decide. And this show, for anybody that is uh, new to it and that is uh, just joining us for the first time, um, is a show about uh, art and design and um, basically all the mistakes we make on the way to creating something new. Uh, we started this show because um, you see a lot of top 10 lists of stuff that you should do, stuff that you shouldn't do um, out there on like No Film School and all the other film blogs and everything like that. But a lot of, uh, you don't see a whole lot of stuff where people talk about um, what they, uh, just making sure my audio is good. Yeah. You don't see a lot of stuff uh, where uh, people talk about, you know, what they did wrong in the past or what they wish they had done differently or anything like that. So that's kind of the theme of the show. Um, but today we have uh, Lori Daniels with us. Uh, she is a makeup artist uh, and has uh, worked on things like um, uh, Wonder Woman 1984 and Harriet and um, lots of other things. Uh, Darren is joining me as my co-host again today uh, since he knows Lori really well. I'm actually going to throw it over to him and let him do her uh, introduction and tell you a little bit more about her. So here's Darren. Hey, everybody. Um... Lori Daniels. What can I say about Lori Daniels? That she sits there and like, oh my gosh. Now, Lori is a friend of mine. She's done makeup for I don't know how many years. And when I lived in Hampton Roads, uh, I worked with her a lot. She did a lot of uh, makeup for me, whatever I was doing, it, whether it was corporate or industrial or my own short little films. She did most of my makeup for me, probably. And um, she always did an awesome job. So we've maintained that relationship. I haven't got to work with her much lately, but Lori uh has worked on like john said a ton of things she, here recently has been like harriet wonder woman 1984 imperium uh, mercy street homeland good lord bird turn the walking dead world beyond uh, a haunting and my favorite i dated a psycho <laughs> <laughs> so anyway i'll be asking Lori a bunch of questions and i told her i had like five pages worth so she has to talk really fast no i only have one page and we probably won't get through all of them which is fine the guys if you have questions you can type those in chat and uh john will let us know and he'll read them and we can uh, see if Lori can uh, answer those as well so my first question let me get my Questions up here on my other screen for you. All right. So, Lori, I want you to tell me a really, really good makeup story where you did something. If you had to, had to do it all again, you wouldn't do it that way. Oh, my. <laughs> I've been doing this 20 years. So there's a lot that comes in and out of your mind that you remember what you did and what you didn't do. Um, I don't know necessarily makeup wise. Um, there was a job that I did five years ago, and this this stands out and will forever probably. It was more about it became a safety issue, and they hired me without telling me there is a lighthouse in the middle of the bay called Smith Point Lighthouse to go up there and all they wanted me to do was put a beard that they had provided on this guy to look like an old light. Go up there. So when I actually get there and they're only going to shoot every evening during, um, you know, a uh, golden hour, I guess y'all know what golden hour is that, you know, right before the sun goes down. So I get out there <clears throat> and I just have to show you a picture because you can't even imagine what it is. But this is the lighthouse. Can you see? Yeah, see? Yeah. Tilt it, tilt it back a little bit. There you there go. There you go. It has no pier around it or anything. It has a ladder on the outside of that bottom. <laughs> <laughs> While you're in a boat, a boat that is crashing against the lighthouse. You're winching your my set bag up. And I'm climbing a rusty metal ladder on the outside. Switch to another ladder and go up on the inside and go to the top. Um, I didn't know I was going to have to do that. On day three, I because it was the most unsafe thing I had ever done. And then I got to thinking, not everyone would physically be able to do this. Uh, day three, I wouldn't go back up anymore because it was just a stunt guy with a beard. So... The, now I look more towards safety, I think, than anything. And there was no one. 
If we had slipped off the boat and fell in between, we would have been beat up against the boat in the lighthouse. And it, and it was a movie and it was a funded movie, not one of the ones you have mentioned, but um, that's something I take into consideration as far as something I'd never do again. Never. <laughs> and you do have to, and you do have to speak up when someone is saying, "Oh, go do that." That's just something. It, it traumatized me actually, and I think I probably did that five years ago. Wow. Yeah. Fifteen years in, and there. Yeah, but <laughs> nope. I was like, it was, that was something. I, I always look at safety now. And it wasn't just, and I mean, it was since Sarah Jones, but it's still yeah. an issue. Yeah. I did it when I probably shouldn't have. Yeah, yeah. And you live and, live and learn. Um, so, uh, okay, I got to ask you the obligatory <clears throat> question. How did you get into yes. makeup for TV and film? Okay, so I'm going to shorten it because everybody has their own different path. No one goes straight in. Usually if I see young people on set, I always say, who do you know? How did you get in the business? know somebody i did accounting for a corporation for several years. and when i was younger i'd always wanted to do makeup i just quit the job went to work for a department store they did all the training on learning how color matching and everything somehow i met someone that worked at the local production new dominion pictures in virginia met them and reenacted and did some stuff out there. But a year later after meeting me, bind. that's how you usually get in. When a production gets in a bind and everybody's working, I went out there and worked one day. And within three weeks, the company got a series and I ended up doing the series as a day player for, cool. so, and then the rest is history. And I cannot believe the places I've been and the people I've met. It's, it's, Incredible. Incredible. Why, why do you enjoy makeup so much? Um, it's always different. I think, and there's all kinds of makeup areas, but I think if I had to go to a studio every day and do the same person every day, all day, I probably wouldn't enjoy it as much as every project is different. And if you love people or you don't exactly get along with somebody, you don't have to work with them the rest of your life for 30 years at a job, at a desk, in a cubicle. Glamorous. It's outside, inside, in the rain, in the cold. But um, I think the, the challenges and the differences are my favorite. Cool. The variety. Yeah. So yes. um, <clears throat> what are some of the bigger or more memorable films you've worked on for good reasons? Good reasons. Well, things that stick out of my mind. And it isn't always about the budget because some of the bigger ones cannot be fabulous. And some of the smaller ones, when you've got each other's back, each department. Um, I just recently got off Good Lord Bird and with Ethan Hawke. And that should be out on Showtime anytime. And I recommend everyone to watch it because it's based on the book. And it was just the crew was caring. And when each department has each other's back, it works. And it was hot. We started in July. The days were 100 plus degrees in the middle of, well, past Richmond. But we were hot. And then we ended in November and we were freezing in the rain and the snow. But um, all of them are different. And it doesn't necessarily depend on how much money they have in their budget, if they're good or fun or not. Who you're with, okay. Um, give me an example. What's one of your most challenging makeup tasks you've, you've had to do other than climbing up this uh, that was, lighthouse? <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was the most traumatic. Um, challenging. Well, I worked on a series called Monsters and Mysteries in America for Nation America, and um, every episode was people have seen these different myths or whatever all over the country and in you know bigfoot and all these different places so basically i took the people had seen say it was red eyes and these kind of teeth and this and i basically made a craft project 
work because it was low budget? No, I just showed up with all of these things listed and I put them on this person. I glued hair all over men's bodies, which I'm sure was itchy and horrible. But, you know, and put all kinds of things. But that was probably the most challenging and the most fun <laughs> because it was like nothing I'd ever done. Okay. Who, uh, you've, you've done, done a lot, lot of uh, uh, bigger stars. stars. And uh, who was, who's some of the favorite ones that you, you did makeup with and why? Uh, well, the um, I did do uh, Daniel Radcliffe was an Imperium. Um, he's just a nice, I call him a kid cause he was in, you know, he's 20 years old, but him, I did, um, recently I did, uh, Steve Martin and Martin short when they came to town, um, for their thing. Um, they were probably the two that I was most starstruck with. <laughs> so then you got to control your, you know, the jitters. Um, I've done a lot of I don't know. It's the bigger now, the big, huge A-list stars usually come with their own. Right. They have personals. So it's, you know, it's so many. I mean, I've done Richard. It, and it all depends on what you watch, if they're a big star to you or not. Like I've done, you know, Richard Petty. Everybody thought was, you know, he is a king of NASCAR and, um, I've done Danny Trejo for some projects. People know him or don't know him. And most people of that caliber are generally very nice and easy to work with. It's when we get in the in between. And the, it, it, <laughs> it, it, that's probably one of the other challenging things is dealing with these. Yeah, I bet. You have an agenda and you have an agenda <laughs> based on the director. Yeah, yeah. So, um, good. Um, so let's change gears a little bit. So what, when you're doing makeup, what is your goal other than of course making them look good, but what is your goal as you start out and you're looking at somebody, how am I going to do this? What's your goal? What are you looking for? Um, well, first off it's what is, what are we looking for? What, how I always break down scripts, try to get the descriptions. Wait, wait, wait. You break down scripts. I do break down scripts. God I bless you. Have to. Um, I usually will break down a script. Well, of course, like when you work on Wonder Woman, you don't even get a script. You don't even get a whole call sheet because everything is so classified. You just get a piece of the call sheet with your name and what time you have to be there <laughs> to that. But when somebody calls me for low budget independent, any, you know, the lower spectrum, even even Discovery Channel television, all of that stuff. When we're negotiating how much their, you know, the rates going to be and all that. I break the script down first because I had someone one time say they only had two special effects in the whole movie, two, and they were simple. When they sent me the script, those, they were, it, the whole show is based on only seven days and they're sunburned and they're blistered and all these things are happening to them. So what they're not realizing is every day we come back to shoot that scene, those all those people have to be sunburned and blistered. And I was like, you can't. It was just for your own good. You need to be prepared for that. And you just but I break down every script as far as when it comes to me being department head or being in charge or the key or whatever. Absolutely. That's have to. OK, so that leads really well into my next question. So. What are the challenges of dealing with uh, special things like that with sunburn or dealing with uh, people with different skin tones from, from one scene to the next or if they're in the same scene together? What, what, are, the, what are the challenges of dealing with that? How, how do you make up someone who's got a dark skin tone as opposed to someone who has a really, really light one? What's the difference? Um, um, well, if you're not afraid of the situation, it's fairly easy. And I find that some of the, the newer makeup artists get afraid. If the person is not their skin tone, they're terrified of them. And then they'll use something, you know, darker skin tones. If you go too light, they turn out gray. But I have found, well, example, when you do, say, for instance, period stuff where you've got all kinds of skin tones. Um, Dirt is not going to show up on darker skin tones. So we just kind of will dirty their nails and we'll shiny them up. 
the lighter skin have you know more dirt or whatever and then there's also um for good lord bird there was color saturation because it was a period piece the bloods are different colors because they just made everything so muted down you had to use bright bloods to use not so much dirt because everything comes up black and darker you just learn as you do your prep and you do your meetings, you're looking for um, what you need to buy. So that's, you know, the bigger the project, the more prep there is, you know, and you just, it's mainly discussing what director in their artsy mind they want to portray. And sometimes they don't even know. Testing and having to use your, your skills to give them the option. Right. They, they don't know what they want, but then when they see something, they know what they don't want. Yeah, right. Okay, so um, is there a difference? Hi, John. Hi. <laughs> You're on screen. So is there a difference between television makeup and film makeup? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. No. Because Treat them all the same. Yeah. yeah. Why would it have been different in the past, just for reference? film film opposed to digital you're similar but then when it started coming into play then we had to start backing off on how much was being put on but fortunately the makeup companies um realize that then they came out with the airbrush and every makeup artist brought an airbrush and then it became when you're in a big trailer with a bunch of makeup artists everybody using an airbrush and can't breathe and because a lot of that stuff has alcohol in it as far as the the base and it's very you can't the makeup companies came out with the high def makeup liquids so they're thin but they cover and then, of course, to get rid of the redness, because that was one of the big things we see with high def and now in the 4K and all that kind of stuff. It's um, makeup or makeup changing for us to help us. But there's still heavy handed makeup artists. You look at I mean, look on YouTube. Ugh, I don't know what <laughs> I, 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 I can't even speak about some of the stuff I see on YouTube. But then again, and if you have a makeup artist that all their photos that they're presenting to you as a director to hire is just them in the photos, forget it. It's easy to do makeup on yourself. The challenge is doing makeup on others. That's that's where the real, you have to be, you know, your expertise comes in, in addition to set etiquette and all those other things. So when, when HD came into existence, what did that do to you as a... A makeup artist what did that do um well i got rid of a lot of the thicker makeups why um, that's when i bought the airbrush but and then it became, people just found it was you know obsolete but it, it was a thinner um cover it even it kind of thing is that because um, you can see so much on hd absolutely and for even for me um if you put that if you put the HD makeup on now really thick on me, you can see like every line. And a lot of the actresses wanted their close-ups to be slightly out of focus. Because no matter what you, you could see, and you still can, you can see everything. <laughs> and then it also increases our background of people. You still didn't have to worry as much about background, but you still see them now. They could be huge um, on the screen. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you have to be lighter hand, but even on period stuff like Mercy Street, which was, you know, all 1850 stuff, those girls, PBS was very strict about, it had to be historical. None of them could have eyeliner, but they wore, they wore, it, it was a process to put that kind of makeup on them. So, um, cause they want it. Those, those actresses are not going to let you send them. The no makeup look does not mean no makeup. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Especially for the women. Although some men can be worse than Who? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't don't answer that. Okay. Um, so um 
when you're on a, a really big shoot like Good Lord Bird or I guess Harriet or Wonder Woman, how does the makeup department work? What's the, the general process? How, what is that like being in the makeup department, whether you're in charge of it or you're just working on it? How does that whole process work? Um, okay, so once you get to that size of a project, basically once you go over $500,000 of budget, you start the union. So it's a, a union thing. Unions hit, that's when hair and makeup have to split up. You got a hair department, they cannot touch the makeup, and you got a makeup department, and they cannot touch the hair. Hmm. So, so everything is, is split at that point. Um, and there's a lot of you, and you actually are working at a slower speed. I had to calm down on my first big union movie because I was running around like I was still on a low budget Discovery Channel crime show. <laughs> I felt like I was the only one and I had to do it all. But no things. Um, but the stress level is there there for every department. Once they step on because the money expense is so high, everything better be right. And no one should be waiting on makeup and hair get a last looks and you go out there and you know it's it's oh there's nothing wrong <laughs> usually there usually there's not you have a lot of professionals at that point experienced yeah so um you said you break down the script do you do anything else in preparation for a big shoot um well once you, or even a small shoot yeah it, it's yes because a small shoot can have just as many things. I look for adjectives about people. It's adjectives. And they're very strong. And I, it was explained, somebody in a job that a long time ago, they were using all these adjectives in their writing. And all of us were, hair, makeup, wardrobe, we're all taking it very seriously, which was driving the budget crazy. The production had to go to the writer, writers and say, you can't, everybody lingers on every word. You know everything from their age and how they're supposed to look and if they're going to go from 20 to 80 in the same show you know that kind of thing i i have to follow all that timeline of stuff um but yeah even on a small i have to i break down everything i need then if it's stuff that's outside of my normal kit i have to give them the budget and look up all the prices of everything they're going to need and always i have to over order if I need one prosthetic piece, you get you have to pay for two because if it gets torn, what if you don't get to shoot it that day and you have to take it off and it's no good and you got to come back and do pickups? You have to think of those things in it head too. And then of course the instant you mentioned blood, <laughs> jack your price up because. You, then you go across everything, especially if there's a head wound, you're in the hair, you're, you know, you're resetting, resetting blood that turns skin pink and you're having to clean that off and some after a while it just doesn't clean and you have to do a makeup job. Um, and you, I've had where there's been blood and you think it's just going to be a head wound it ends up on the wardrobe and then they don't have any backup and then it becomes, you know, that's all money and time. What kind of effect does that have on just the timetable of things and how long it takes to get things done then? Well, it depends when they've just got a cut on the face or so, a bloody, let's say bloody nose. Um, if you've got to start with the fight again, um, you've got to clean that bloody nose. And after so much, and we buy some of the best bloods out there <laughs> and they still, hey, blood's expensive. <laughs> That's, that, that's a good quote. We buy some of the best bloods out there. And it's expensive. <laughs> I've said some of the weirdest things in this business. It's like, does he have his murder clothes on after lunch? When we get back from lunch, does he have his murder clothes? You know, that kind of stuff. It's just like, you never see that stuff in real life. But no, bloods are very expensive. But trying to clean them off after so many resets, it will turn everything pink and there's nothing out there that takes it off. I mean, shaving cream is a trick. Once it stain stains, we have to actually, you know, stop foundation over it to redo them like they went out there just to cover it. 
So, um, so or changing clothes, blood and period stuff because you're dirtying and all that kind of stuff are probably an aging. Aging is going to be, and I try to tell aging is the hardest and the most expensive thing to do because it is wigs and glasses and wrinkling and can be prosthetics and but people are like can you just age them aging is one of the hardest and time consuming things to do so benjamin button was expensive yes that's why it won yes you have a team People seem to think that there's this one makeup artist that walks in and did Benjamin Button and everything's fine. No, there's a whole team <laughs> making all those pieces. They've got backup pieces. They've got a team to clean them up. That's the other thing. So when you're scheduling a 10-hour day in the normal world, um, you have to clean these people up, take stuff off of them. And unfortunately, when it's you know small budget, they think at 10 hours, you're just gonna, they're gonna call rap and you walk away and you don't. You don't just walk away. You've got actors that have to have stuff removed, even if it's, and then there's, you know, there's tattoo coverings, which that's a, that's a thing. Actors won't tell you they have tattoos because they want the job. And then ta uh, agencies send them or whoever, wherever you get them from. Um, and it doesn't matter what shoot, it's across the board. They show up and they have something major that has to be covered. <laughs> and that can be time consuming and, and has caused problems many times. I, su I suggest that actress or actresses that have those should learn how to cover them themselves. So when they do go to low budget, they're covered when they get there. That's a, <laughs> the only way they should not be is if you're in a bigger and tattoos can get productions in trouble. So. Yeah, the whole blood issue you're talking about reminds me of um, John of Stranger Things, where that when the main actress girl, her nose is bloody like every other scene. So I don't know if you've seen that or not, Lori. I have not, but I do have a story. Okay. I have a story. So we shot a movie in Norfolk um, last year called The Gateway. Should be out here soon or whatever. But on the very first day of shooting, I, we haven't even shot the fight scene, which is like days away on the first day of shooting. And it wasn't in the script and it broke it down. So new all of a sudden this, I'm going to call him fairly inexperienced director because mainly music video kind of thing. All of a sudden he wants this, this lead to have a bloody nose. So I question it politely. Uh, this wasn't how it's going to be when we fight. Nope. He's got to have a bloody nose. So I'm like, okay, so I put the bloody nose on him. The scene is going to be shot. It's him running. When we finally get to the bar scene, nose, he's going to be running from these bad guys for days. Like, well, our days. It's like not even 24 hours. He's trying to get back to his dad's house. So that bloody nose caused us to have to, the almost the entire mo movie is him with a bloody nose. And <laughs> script supervisor had to get together to figure out at what point can he wash that off his nose because he's not certainly while he's running from these bad guys going to stop and wash his nose because he's on a subway and he's here and he's got this woman and a little kid but because that director made that from the hip decision that cost that guy having to wear this bloody nose days and days and days and going back and forth bloody knows this scene not bloody knows that scene so but that is that is just someone just saying oh blood no nope, it's not that easy but hmm. at all wow um i got one if um i can interject sure. Darren. Sure. so um i uh, i'm actually a dp so i'm always curious because uh you know if you're a DP, then your stuff can't look good if you don't have a good production designer, if you don't have a good makeup artist. Um, so my question is, what is one of the things that you see DPs do a lot or, um, or one of the issues you have with working with DPs um, in ter terms of lighting or whatever um, that you've seen that maybe could be better, maybe would be 
uh, would be better if the DP knew a little bit more about what you guys are, are doing and um, what your process is uh, in terms of how to make stuff look good on camera. Okay. Oh, let me get my knuckles cracked for this one. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, the biggest, and this happens, makeup or, makeup departments fight. We usually fight with the gaffer because the DP throws the gaffer under the bus. But <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the lighting, and they keep saying that the actor is shiny. And you walk up, the actor has not a drop of oil or anything. You've powdered them to the, they're so flat. And it's the light is so hot that they keep telling makeup to go in there. And we do get into, you know, little scuffles about, I mean, there's, there's only so much you can, much powder you can put on and there's not anything happening. Um, and then like locally, cause I do a lot, a lot of local car commercials and stuff and they're so blown out. And if I had known, and sometimes you're either the DP is going to saturate the color and that can make the makeup even brighter than what you did, even if you did it naturally or, but if it's going to be blown out, like these car dealerships that have all of this glass in their, you know, their showrooms and they can't be controlled. Everybody looks so white and washed out, even though I know that I had, you know, done uh, a normal, he looked healthy when he went out there, makeup. So usually I think the only thing that we really get into a thing with is, you know, lighting is, is kind of, I don't remember. Now I have some DPs and Darren probably knows who he is, um, is very particular about hair. <laughs> can't have a hair hair out of place and, and and that also leads me to the i've seen a lot of that when they're blonde and they're up against the backdrop snip snip <laughs> you can only do so much of that i thought you were telling me to cut it shut up <laughs> um, yeah uh so yeah from a, i mean I'm not going to outrank a DP. A DP, I, I respect what they're telling me to do. A director, I mean, we're we're trying to do whatever the directors, DPs, producer, whatever. Is We don't want to get into any kind of, we're just trying to make it happen. And like, like the director that wanted to do the blood, I questioned it because maybe he didn't think about it. But once they want to go forward with it, we do it. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, we're trying to accomplish the vision, the art vision, not just our little makeup vision. Yeah. So. So um, I got a question. We're going to shift gears a little bit. So um, there comes at least, I mean, I'm a director. So there, there comes a point in a director's career where you begin to realize makeup is important. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, it's, there comes this point, like when I was doing my, probably my, my student film or something, I, Ah, makeup. I want them to look natural. We don't, we don't need makeup, you know. But then at some point you realize, oh, wow, I should have had makeup on that. And then you kind of realize you need makeup. So why is makeup so – just a general question. Why is makeup so important for people that don't haven't crossed that bridge yet realizing that it is important? It is important, and it's not cheap or inexpensive, I should say, not cheap. It's not it, – yeah, it's not an inexpensive uh, person to hire if they're if they have any, you know – skills um and i'm not there i only get to hear the stories of what happens when there is no makeup artist and there's been some crazy things i mean even the ear piercing or companies that are conservative that you know they don't want the ear you know the nose ring and the earrings and we now can cover those holes or the tattoos or the needs to shave them for, you know, you know, well, we did PP stuff a long time ago where people couldn't have facial hair because the things didn't, you know, go around their face. And we're there to expedite that so that producers and directors and DPs are trying to deal with their own. They don't need to be back there trying to deal with shaving someone. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter to this day when we ask, because if they hire one makeup artist and they have 30 actors coming in because you got a backgrounds or whatever that you're not, you got one talking head and a, you know, a bunch of background. 
You can still ask them to come camera ready, but I will guarantee you the guy, I mean, the guys don't really wear makeup or whatever, as far as bringing it camera ready, but I will guarantee you if there's 10 people, maybe two will come and look presentable. The rest were either having to fix or they still have absolutely nothing on. So even if you say camera ready, half of them, because the talent agencies will just send whatever, whoever, just send a body, and then everybody else is left to deal with it. You're totally left to deal with it. And like I said um, the other day, in addition to that, when you have a specific, when I break down a script and you have a specific character that is this, um, has an eight for months or, you know, whatever, he's on an island and he's stranded and whatever, do not send a 250 or 300 pound person as this guy on this island that has an eight for a month. And then I've even had things like, you know, they show up blonde and they need to be brown because they're not like their headshot. There's that too. That's That has been dealt with on the day of a shoot so many times where they look nothing like their headshot. So that that's examples of what I've had to deal with. And that may be even some of the most challenging stuff I've had to deal with. It's like uh, you were supposed to have long hair and now you have this bob or or whatever. <laughs> So you can never, I always would make actors send me a selfie. That spoke a thousand times more than a headshot. The selfie, two days before the shoot, that way I knew what we were dealing with and we could recast. You can't recast when you're standing there. You can if you got the money to sit around, but there's no time for that. You just got to do the best you can. Okay. So let's talk about some more practical stuff. Um, so... Uh, when you're needing makeup for a low budget film or maybe even like a student film, mm -hmm. uh, what can and should be done at very low cost to the production? Because they probably don't have the budget. What, what can be done just on a basic level? Well, the first, well, after you break down the script and see, um, and somebody, even if it was somebody, if you couldn't afford it, somebody that could break it down for you, makeup wise, that could look for those things. Um, there's, I mean, there's something that even, and this might go back to a DP question because I see DPs and they always get afraid of me when they have a little makeup bag that they pull out because <laughs> they, they think that, they think, <laughs> hey, you're not going to be in the makeup department. Don't be taking my work. <laughs> but, <laughs> no. but, but what happens for them when they're DP directing and doing interviews and they're on the road and it's there's no makeup it's just a skeletal crew so what they do have and every the makeup industry has changed and this is what's great and i have a little a little this is the product let's see if you can see it where is it where am i okay it's called black opal and it's an invisible powder it goes on every skin tone Ooh. and it take it says invisible on the back most of them, because the makeup industry buys these up all over, you have to usually get it online. You used to could get it in Walmart and Target. And then when makeup artists figured it out, we bought it all up. But yes, it's called Black Opal. So all you need is this. Used to, you'd have to have like six colors to do everything. Does everybody, it's just an oil absorber. And hey, Lori, you... Lori, can I, can you show, yeah. uh, just hold that up again. I was um, a noob and didn't put you up when you were holding it up. Oh, Okay. There's the product. It's called Black Opal. How much does it cost? I think they're nine dollars. No, it's not bad at all. Hmm. Well, the old the old oil blotters were twenty two, and you had to buy six colors. Do you, now? Do you ever use? I know one thing I used to use. This has been years. Was uh, those those little sheets that also absorbed up oil and stuff? Up oh, there, you go. <laughs> there you go. You can do that. You can have. We carry these all the time. I have actually a little anti-shine kind of kit just for a, but these you can buy anywhere um i would definitely buy generic because they are not cheap like what, what, what was that cost right there um price six maybe well this one's a little generic i think this one's target but they're like six dollars for mm -hmm. a thing of these when you can buy this and now here's the deal when you're using the powders 
you need to really, you should buy yourself a bag of sponges. We've all seen these. You can cut these in half. You don't need a whole one and waste it. Just cut them in half or pull them apart. They'll pull apart. So to have a few of those, you can buy them at Sally's. You can buy these anywhere. They're pretty cheap. I think a bag, a whole big bag, six dollars. And for someone that's not doing it every day, it probably lasts you forever. Um, but if the person is sweating, do not just just blot them with a paper towel. Do not take those sponges and put them in a powder. It ruins the powder, mm -hmm. contaminates the powder. Take their sweat off first with just or give them a paper towel, whatever. I always feel weird when I give an actor because I feel like they're doing my job, but sometimes it's just you have to. There's too many people and they have to blot themselves or you give them. And especially if they first start on camera, they're sweating anyway. And after a couple of takes, they stop if it's not about heat. Mm -hmm. But those and then you also need makeup wipes. You have something to, clean, you know, I'd have something uh, or anything. Cheapo makeup wipes, baby wipes. They're good for everything imaginable. But that would be what I would definitely always have. But that's, oh, oh, one other thing. Hairspray of any kind. You can get little teeny bottles for $1.99. That's for those hair things that we discussed. But that's, that's a good little sum to have on the road or anytime you can't have a makeup artist. Just because when people are sweating and oily, you want some oil, but that just, it gets gross because the high def, you see everything. But like on Harriet, though, we wanted everybody to shine. So we didn't just let them shine. We use sunscreen spray that doesn't, when it's, they sweat, it doesn't get in their eyes and burn that, you know, the sports spray. Just a little trick. They didn't want everybody to be matte and like what we might think they look like. It's more like pleasing on to the eye <laughs> on camera who wants to see somebody just water off the end of their nose never let that <laughs> i mean <laughs> it's realistic but realistic isn't always how it should be <laughs> no <laughs> the world according to Lori. okay <laughs> well no i mean they all say oh well that would be realistic but yeah. if it's just unpleasing just you know little fix goes a long way yeah. Okay. So good. That was awesome. <clears throat> so for about less than 20 bucks, so make it have a little kit for the, for the most part, at least to keep people from shining. Exactly. If you don't want them to shine. Exactly. That powder is not super thick, so it's not really going to cover a zit or something. But then once you start into all that, then you've got to learn, you know, color matching. And, you know, so that really, I don't really see DPs carrying around, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, now, if you, but, going forward to like a film or a student film or something like that. Um, depending on what's in the script, Ben Nye has been around forever and it's inexpensive. It's a what makeup. It? Ben Nye. He was a famous makeup artist. Okay. He and in my most costume shops carry it. It's kind of, we in the makeup industry say it's kind of antiquated stuff, but it's still great for beginners and people that can't afford these, um, big expensive tattoo palettes and that we use for dirt. All of these are like, this is what we use now. Like, cause it doesn't come off like for bruises and wounds and, and all that, but it's they're They're not students. Yeah. That's not worth it. But Ben Nye makes these little wheels. You see, where am I at here? Okay. They're just, and they come smaller than that too, but that's a whole, all the colors in the bruise or wound. Mm. It's called the FX wheel or a master oh, cool. wheel. And then you can get them at most costume shops everywhere online. Everybody carries Ben Nye, but it's cream. So it has to be set, you can set it with your black opal powder. You need to set it. And then like this one, where am I at here? Okay, this is a death wheel. So if you need to make it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're all called that kind of stuff. Sounds like a name for a, a heavy metal band or something. Exactly. It's yeah, it's a death wheel, <laughs> but gives you all your paleness and like this dark, you can make people look sick under the eyes. 
so it's very it simplifies everything but you can get all these colors individually like if someone walked in and just said i need you know sunburn they even have a little sunburn wheel that would just be you know and they're like the little ones are like 10 bucks which is cheap compared to like um these that we use now that are 85 dollars a piece and we have every kind like there's a grunge one that's nothing but dirt colors and there's a um like yeah this one's dirt so which is as brown and black and then there's you know, they cover tattoos that's what they really they're called tattoo palettes but they do all kinds of everything there's there's tons of them there's one depending on the makeup artist like if the makeup artist worked on walking dead they have their own walking dead palettes if you wanted to do zombies you just buy that palette and do it but all that stuff works with like 99 percent alcohol Okay. But that's just a brief, that's just a brief thing. So people know there is stuff out there that doesn't come off easily so that you can wear it all day long. But the Ben Nye is just something that is still around, inexpensive, and has hundreds and hundreds of colors. So, um, and then one more thing I would like to show everybody, because everybody's always in a special effects. That's everybody's kind of thing. Um <laughs> That's what I get the most questions about. I'm special effects because Face Off, the TV show Face Off for the makeup competition kind of brought a lot of people into the industry falsely because they thought that, have you ever seen the show where they compete? There's makeup. I artists? know of it. Yeah. I know okay. Of it. It, well, it's false because they're making them do wardrobe and they're making them do hair and they're making them do all that stuff. And then they never showed the cleanup process and they put so much glue on those people. It's amazing. So it kind of really didn't give a really great look into the makeup industry as far as how it works. Because it was, it was, you know, it was for fun. It was contestant. But they do make for if you need cheap cuts and wounds because you don't have anybody to do them. These are like tattoos. You know, the lick them and stick them, but they're 3D. <laughs> so, yeah, they've already got the gel. You, you turn them over. You put some warm water on them. And they go on the skin, they're 3D, you add some blood, and you've got a, a cut. Cool. But they have all kinds. They're called Tinsley transfers, but they have everything. Where do, you get, where do you get those? Um, I got these at the local costume shop. Do you guys have a costume shop where you guys are? Uh, only around there, Halloween, is a, I think. So. There, there is actually one downtown, Darren. Is there? Okay. Yeah. Kind of it's, like, not, it's not real big, but... Yeah, but usually they'll carry the basic stuff, like the Ben Nye stuff. Mm -hmm. or that but these yeah these are just like this whole kit and it even comes with like plastic glass so if you did a storm and someone um got hit with glass you can put mm -hmm. these little plastic pieces inside that it's a whole little kit you can do whatever you want but now is this know, is, is this something people could buy on amazon too or is it yeah. is it mainly just at comic or uh no. costume no. oh gosh this is it these um they're called this one's tinsley he was a he's a famous makeup artist too but they have all kinds of different things like if you wanted a broken nose or mm -hmm. basically it's just you flip it over and peel the paper and stick it and put warm water and it sticks right to it cool so it's not all the gluing of the latex and the you know all the complicated things that you think of if it's something you know for a student film or something that's quick and easy they've really come a long way with um we're kind of going in the opposite direction. Everything's getting harder and more expensive. But for Halloween, has gotten so high tech and this cosplay stuff and all that kind of things. You know, the companies are making stuff that's not so expensive. Hmm. Cool. Cool. Um, Don, do you get any questions yet? Yeah, uh, I got one from uh, Katie, actually. Uh, so Katie asks, when the cameras are rolling, are you behind the camera ready to jump in and do touch ups between takes or back at the trailer getting the next set of actors ready? Okay. It's a good question. Um, there is always, 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 if not one or multiple makeup artists behind the monitor. There's several sets of monitors usually. So like hair, makeup, wardrobe, and people are looking in case we see something. Back at the trailer will depend on, each makeup artist is kind of assigned a certain actor or actress. So say my actor is on set, I'm on set watching them. 
And if the other people are, if some other people are coming in, then that other makeup artist, but you know, there's several of us usually on a bigger show, but no, if you only have one person, now I've had that, um, and there's nobody there, sometimes maybe your hair person can help you if it's, as long as it's not union, if it's union, that can't happen. They have to hire enough people for that. But if it's one person, you've got to get those people ready. So you just have to leave. And I have, on many occasions, when it's low budget, I've had to run from the makeup room to set. And it can be a couple blocks down the road and fix something and then go back. But yeah, there's on the bigger shows, there's always a makeup artist and a hair person on set. I've probably made you run a few times. I've ran. <laughs> I've run a lot and you're not supposed to run. So I say run, but I mean, you're, you're not allowed to really run on the big sets. The medics will scream at you, but um, no, it's, it's kind of, it's a very organized plan of how you have to be on, on set and getting people ready. Okay. Uh, going the opposite direction of all the heavy makeup. If a director says, and we, you touched on this earlier, if a director says, I want the natural look, what does that mean for you? Well, it, it means even the skin, it means to give them a little bit, especially women. Well, you know, give them a little something, you know, light concealer, like there's chapstick, no color to the lip, um, you know, fill in the brows a little bit, but it's very light handed. There's st it doesn't mean natural meaning. No, it just means uh, things that really you don't really notice. Um, but it needs to be there just to enhance. Well, you want to kind of enhance the confidence of the actress. I've been in big fights and it wasn't too long ago with background that uh, my department head said they are to get nothing, 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 nothing. Cause there was period and it was background and there was hundreds and we really didn't need to spend all the time. And one woman <laughs> was very angry but and then I've had the opposite where we do them like we've been instructed to do. And the actress will take off and go to the bathroom and do her own how she thinks it needs to be. <laughs> and um, I've actually had directors come at me thinking that I did it. And, I, you know, so I get put in those kind of positions, too. But don't worry. I mean, I'll call them out. I have no problem calling them out. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, <laughs> I was told specifically, that's where the, and that's why I don't do weddings because <laughs> I don't have to take the direction of the bride and I don't have to take the direction of the actor. I have to take the direction from directors and, you know, DPs or who's in charge. But this, I was told specifically that this woman wears heavy black eyeliner. We do not want her to have it. So I didn't do it. And she got up, went to the bathroom, and ran straight to set without me seeing her. Huh. And then they brought her back in and tried to jump on me about it. And I'm like, oh, did you put more eye? We know. Makeup <laughs> artists know what they do. <laughs> we do. It's amazing. I can have 300 people, and I'm like, I didn't do that. How did you slip by? Did you throw her under the bus? I threw her right under the bus. <laughs> I don't throw crew members under the bus, but I'll throw an actor under the bus. <laughs> That's another good quote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Actors beware. <laughs> well, I have a, I, I, we have a few more questions that have come in. Um, okay. So, uh, Kira would like to know, are there any good blood recipes, going back a little ways here, but are there any good blood recipes that they should use, or should they invest in pre-made blood? Okay. Good question. Because... Makeup artists have quit making blood recipes. It's fine for set, set decorating and props because they use so much of it. Blood recipes stain and they're horrible stainers. And these new bloods are trying to not stain, especially mouth blood. Some of them now will say non-staining. But Ben Nye, the company that I was talking about, they have bloods that um, aren't as expensive. The problem, sometimes they'll turn pink if you water them down. So many bloods. 
for makeup, I would definitely invest in a little blood, part of your budget, but a little blood goes a long way. <laughs> it re For makeup, it does. It really, you think, I mean, <laughs> I've got every kind of formula of blood. The base ingredient of blood is caro syrup. So if you want to start experimenting and looking, but I don't suggest it on skin. It just no recipe I've found so far um, won't stain and be and just slows the process of everything down. It really does. Okay, How long does cool. It take for stain to come out. Other, so you take other it, out, it really needs to be hot water. We can get it really muted down with shaving cream. Mm. If it's really, you know, if it's good blood, or some of them say non-staining, and then they still end up staining. Um, but the homemade ones, they're, they're real. It's that's back when set deck and props and everyone would get, a, you know, they'd have gallons of blood and we would just use it or whatever. And it just, it's, they can use the staining blood cause it's not being put on the skin, but for us, it really, and in addition to that, they've got all these colors now, and like I said, with this period stuff and doing color saturation, you don't want to use the dark bloods. The bright ones still look like blood. If you use a dark one, it comes out black on the screen. Mm -hmm. it's just so dark. So there's that. You must know what what the DPs and whatever are filming in or how much color saturation there is. So do you ever get it? Um, so this is a question for me. Uh, we do have a couple more from the audience too. But uh, so do you ever get any kind of lookbook or anything from the DP or um, anything they've worked on with the production designer or whatever to kind of give you an idea of, okay, this is going to be, you know, muted period stuff. Yes. Um, okay. So, okay, good. So Answer is yes. <laughs> okay. Um, for us, what we got um, and that's all discussed in pre-production meetings because you have to go with every department head will go through every single thing in the script. But what they did on Good Lord Bird, because I had never seen um, a show so saturated in color. Like they put this bright red shirt on um, one of the guys and it would look like, like deep, dark rust color. Hmm. So what they do, and that is why most shows will do a camera test the day before uh -huh, camera tests camera test yes you, uh, <laughs> there's going to be something major in the show or a certain look those people will be brought in they'll be wardrobed they will have makeup they will have hair to make sure especially leads to make sure that's the look that they wanted Cool. because i think a lot of things on harriet where the wigs had to be changed and they didn't like those are you don't want that the first day of shooting to be the day that you're deciding that that's the wrong color or you don't like that, you know, but, okay. um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, yeah, we got some more. Uh, so I think this one's probably pretty quick, but, uh, how many are usually in your department on big sets and smaller sets? Okay. Um, for, for, let's just say, does I keep saying discovery channel, but that's where I worked for 15 years shows like that. But, um, one, <laughs> it was me. <laughs> so that's when, that's when I, and, and it was, it was a lot going on. Um, and you did a good job I, doing it too. And, well, you have to, you have to be a hard worker. You have to be on time and you have to um, pick and choose your battles. Who's your main people that need to be done or important and who's not as important. Mm -hmm. Who you may never see and who, that is where you, that's like a, just a something else. It doesn't even have to do with makeup. You pick and choose who needs to go just to get the production done. Now, the biggest show I've worked on was Wonder Woman 84. Um, I think 350 million, not sure. But there were 30 makeup artists and 30 hair people. Wow. My and goodness. we had to, um, uh, I can't really... Well, it hadn't come out, so I can't really tell anything because they've got me all signed up on all <laughs> it's okay. non-disclosure agreements. Um, but uh, they wanted them through fast, so they brought it. They would bring them in, and they had a person just standing there putting them in chairs and making sure because all of them had to be done for the first scene. Uh, they had to be because they were just all over the place. 
Hmm. And um, and and it was 1984, so it's still period. So hair people and 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 that's when I graduated. So I kind of know it was like that when the punk started coming in and the hair color and the big hair. And but yeah, so it can be anywhere from one person running everything to that many. And it, it was it, it was quite the scene, I guess. But now typically. Typically, you're going to be you, maybe an assistant. You know, it, it depends on what's in that script. Mm-hmm. And the makeup artist has to tell them, uh, I can't do this. Or you tell them, that was the biggest thing on my monster show. Because those shows were only 10-hour days. And they would give me a monster that would take two hours or two and a half hours to put together. And then I had to clean him up, which typically takes... If you put it on in two, it's typically going to take an, a half that time to take it off if it's glue and hair and all those things. So then they had to take that into consideration that they couldn't be shooting or we have to have a pre-call. Makeup artists make have to come in way longer than they because they will pre-call us before the shoot. They do not want that big crew sitting there waiting on the makeup department. No way. Cool. Well, speaking of uh, Wonder Woman 1984, um, I have somebody that wants to know, did you get to meet Gal Gadot? And <laughs> what is she like, if you did? No. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, very uh, well guarded. Um, they don't. And, and also what happens when you have that many hair and makeup people, um, we all don't go to set. We don't have 60 people sitting behind a monitor. That's going to be... <laughs> It's bad enough when there's six um, of each department sitting behind a monitor. Everybody's fighting for spots, and we're all, you know, trying to look. And that's that's the reason we're shut down right now because we're all in little tight spaces um, when we're working. But um, no, she, I didn't get to meet her because we didn't always go to set. So, but I'm sure I hear she's very nice and very pretty and very. <laughs> For all the grips and lighting departments that got to see her, she was. <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> but it should be a very cool movie. I got to see uh, uh, some cool stuff, but no, I didn't get to meet her. So. Cool. All right, the last question I have in the chat: um, If makeup is done incorrectly, either too much or not enough, for example, what are some of the consequences you've seen? Um, and I'm, I'm guessing this is like what is what's one of the most interesting con- consequences you've seen of makeup being done poorly. I, if you have a story. I usually, well, I don't usually do it wrong, John. But, <laughs> hey, it's the chat's question, not mine. <laughs> I'm only kidding. You never know until you get them on camera if there's something that's especially effects-wise. Sometimes you think you can get away with stuff. Things are rubbing off if their body is painted, and you just have to constantly get in there and redo and redo. Um, things that I have seen The biggest things that I see on TV, I criticize everything on the TV and movies, but I watch continuity for if they get a wound, how long it takes to heal, if it's there in the very next scene or not. Um, Things, (laughs) the things that are the worst, I think, is um, makeup not matching the skin tone, neither just being totally the wrong color. And typically, that can be a makeup artist that doesn't have a good range of color doesn't know what she's doing or drugstore stuff. So there, there's another thing too. If you are having stills taken at the same time you're filming, there is an ingredient that is in foundations. It's called mica or silica. And it's basically for street wear and it scatters the light to make you look more even and that kind of stuff. On a camera, a still photography camera, it will come up flash and white. Like if you ever see that the face is different color than the neck and all that, that's that. So that's mm. that's that can be a problem too. But um, I don't know. Makeup artists, we try. If we see something, that's why we're given last looks. And if it's something mm-hmm. major, we go in with our friends or buddies or makeup artist people, and we get in there and we fix it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just have to fix it. Mm-hmm. If you see it, but, you know, it, the biggest thing I see is just color mismatch, really. Okay. Or overdoing it, overdoing it. I, this whole, this whole YouTube, um, 
I'm not which even we, which we are name. streaming on YouTube, by the way. I know. Know it on there. They're doing all of these demonstrations that they're good for if they want to walk out and go out on a date or go somewhere or do whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you get heavy-handed on these shows, you just can't. You've got to look at what the show is about and make it neutral. That's what that's what I mean. Um, it's mm -hmm. that it's just some makeup artists are too heavy handed and they usually do their makeup like themselves. And, you know, just they've just got to be open to do however it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. Okay. <laughs> I'm not knocking YouTube. I've learned. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know what? But I'm going to tell you this, because when I started in the business, we didn't have Internet. And when I had to do diseases and wounds, You'd have to look in a book to see what. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, there was books back in. That's the like day. that's like ancient technology or something, right? Yes. So there was yes. When I needed to do this thing about bed sores and all this, I mean, we didn't have the internet to look it up, so I could see what the bed sore needed to look like. Hmm. And so that's yeah. So no, don't get me wrong. YouTube, I've done a lot, learned a lot of stuff, but you also when you look at the images. When I look at images, I can tell if it's makeup and if it's real. So if you want to replicate something, you really need to find what the real thing looks like, not what somebody's interpretation of makeup is. Cool. So I have a question for you. So do you, for someone that's doing like a student film and they don't have a big budget, what advice do you give them? Because I'm assuming you can do just keeping them from shining up to a point. And then once you start applying stuff, then you go past the point of no return. you got to go ahead and... T t talk to me about that. Where's where's the point where you need to stop or or stop because you don't know what you're doing or what? I think once you start color matching, you don't know what you're doing. Most people don't know how to do that. You know, to try to say they've got acne on one side of their face or something. Most people, you just can't take something and just start covering it. It's kind of, you know, you got to figure it out and you got to lightly brush it and then you get into brushes and um, you really probably should find someone that's willing to help you a little bit. In a student film you shouldn't just i don't think you should just write it off and certainly you pro do you have a three theater department do you, i mean mm -hmm. if somebody goes yeah, to a school that has a theater department now let me tell you theater makeup and my makeup because there's so many different you know avenues people can go are nowhere near the same they're, they're playing to a different i'm playing from what six inches away and they're playing from middle of the house mm -hmm. but someone that knows a little that could help you it would really you know it might be worth you know begging them i mean you know <laughs> let's see i've yeah. had my days of freebies and student films and stuff. Done free, you've done free ones for me before <laughs> <laughs> but um don't let that get out there darren <laughs> that was a long time ago she i can't, I can't afford her now. Yeah, for people starting out, it might be, you know, at least if they had a little kit of some sort just to help you out. But don't write a script that has big expectations. That's, mm -hmm. you really have to think about it. And I mean, you can if you've got someone that can help you. You have someone that can help you do all that right away. But when you, every time you mention the word blood, I mean, adjective, a black guy, any little thing can just put you into some money and time. Mm -hmm. I'll think about that. Yeah. All right. Well, I think chat's about um, about wrapped up on questions. Darren, do you have any any last questions we want yeah, to? Got, We've I been going one, for over an hour, so I got one last question. Okay. All right. So, uh, Lori, tell me your best makeup famous actor story without making anybody look bad. Oh my! I don't know. Oh, do, does it have to be about makeup? Can it be how about? Home? No, I don't care. All right. All right. So. My, my most favorite actor that I've ever worked with, and I'm going to go back to him, is Daniel Radcliffe. Not because he's Harry Potter, but he was the nicest, easiest person to work with. And let me tell you what he did, because I love to see this kind of stuff in Hollywood, especially as famous as he is. So we're shooting up in near Richmond in a very, very poor, distressed town. And... Everybody knows he's in town. I've never had, I've never seen crime scene tape around base camp to keep the public out. 
Never have I done that. And there's been a lot of famous people I've worked with. But they would find out where he was and stuff like that. Well, there was this little like thrift store, consignment store, something, very poor town. And this guy had come up with, you know, whatever Harry Potter kind of items he had. And he'd made a display. And somebody told Daniel, well, he had a break that this guy, you know, had done that. Daniel went into that store, took a picture with every item, signed every item so that man could make more money for his store. And we thought that is the nicest thing I think I've ever seen a, a celebrity of his caliber do. Hmm. But um, there's so many. I mean, there's so many. I don't know. I've done. I, <laughs> I only can think, I don't even, I don't even think I can think of anyone that I'd have dirt, dirt on. Maybe yeah. I do. Hey. I don't know. Save it, save it for later. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, there, there's plenty in that, but that's the other thing. In makeup artists, we are in people's faces. We have to really get to know them and, um, and they'll be totally different people to directors and DPs. They can either be really bad to us or really nice to us, but we have to make them feel comfortable, make them think they're getting what they need to the best that we can. Um, I find I find that the people that aren't as popular are kind of the hardest to deal with. The ones mm -hmm. that just step from background to their first speaking gig it can be probably the worst, but you, and you just have to do the best you can. But, still have to deal with personality so cool well um i think we're gonna wrap it up but before we do uh lori can you tell us and tell people watching where can they find you where can they follow what you're doing they can't Oof. <laughs> <laughs> i've been told i'm the best kept secret <laughs> <laughs> no um actually i don't i i I think it's because, and I know this is going to be a lame excuse, um, I've been doing it so long, it's been word of mouth, it took me forever to just get a reel together for the, to get in the union because I was running and gunning for 15 years of just doing and doing, and I didn't even have time to take a picture. <laughs> I was just going and going and going, there was, and I didn't have, um, smartphones when I started. It was a major take a picture with a camera. So um, the only the only place that you can find me is on IMDB and I'm Lori Daniels. It says two, but I think I was the first one too, but I had to something happen. There was one little actress named Lori Daniels a zillion years ago. But yeah, I'm on IMDB. You can see what I'm doing. But no, I don't have a following. I'm not Instagrammer. I'm just a old-fashioned makeup artist who's sitting at home <laughs> <laughs> with all my needing to do if anybody hasn't noticed that all that makeup back there needs to be organized so that's that's gonna be my next <laughs> oh i thought it was organized you've got all your little containers and stuff oh my gosh it's a mess i don't even know what i have it's just you can't even open the drawers there's just oh. lost control oh uh uh, Katie has one more question if, if we're okay with uh, sure. taking it real quick. Um, so she, Katie would like to know, uh, what is one thing that has surprised you the most while being in the industry? All the things that I've done. I've done just the crazy thing. Like you learn everything. So you're very well-rounded. I worked for um, a company that did HR videos. I learned all about every kind of harassment, no demand. Um, <laughs> I know, what, I know what PPE is. I knew a lot many years ago. Um, I've been on the USS Cole um, after it was repaired to do a reenactment for the BBC. I've been um, I've been in real life prisons. What was that again? Real life li prisons. Oh. Prisons. Ugh, that's horrible. Um, um, I've. I've been with a crew, they rented private 757 and flew us to the Caymans and we shot for nine days on an old ship. I've sailed on several old ships. Um, I've learned just amazing, I, 
I don't know. Did you use my cow picture of me wiping the cow? No, I didn't. I should have used that one. I'm sorry. That movie. That's my favorite picture. So that was at a dairy. I spent the whole day there shooting at a dairy. Um, I learned more about milk that day and how <laughs> I ever time about the trucks picking it up and no antibiotics and all. So it's just, that is the most, and that's going to be any crew member, any crew member. If you, you be in it as long as I have and got to do all the different things, based at the different things that you learn about all of society, everything in history, working on Turn and Harriet and and um, uh, Mercy Street. I've learned more about the 1800s than anybody would ever, ever learn. So, cool. That's probably the greatest thing of my career is doing everything. Okay. Well. Cool. Um, so Lori, Darren, do you have any final notes? No, I just want to say thank you so much, Lori. Um, been trying to get you to do something with the, with us for a while and finally able to do this. This is great. Uh, I think a lot of good information for people who are watching and we've taped this. So if they, people miss it, they can still go back and watch it. And I just really uh, appreciate you and appreciate, uh, you helping us out here and, and hopefully we well, all get back to work soon. I know. I know. I think what's going to happen is once they, the, the, floodgates open up every production's going to start at once and there's not going to be enough production people and everybody's going to be working so that's that's what i'm i'm hoping i guess anyway but i appreciate you guys having the faith in me it's fun to talk about my career i could talk about it there's just so many things and i can't think of all of them at one time but thank you yeah. very much yeah thank you for coming um and chat would like to we have several people in chat that are saying thank you as well oh good um, so looks like they enjoyed it. Okay. Um, okay. Well, everyone, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, this has been the uh, the False Takes show. We're gonna go with show. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in uh, again. Um, we will be back again uh, next week uh, with another guest. Um, so keep an eye on um, your email and uh, you know Twitter and everything else. Um, our Twitter, if you want to follow us, is down in the description, and that's where we will post when we have new uh, guests coming. Um, so until next time, thank you guys so much for, for watching and joining us. And um, thank you, Darren. Thank you, Lori. And uh, we hope you guys will join us next time. Oh, and the, um, all the products, I put it in, in chat, uh, will be uh, available, or I'll put links to them in the description box down below um, after I edit and post this um, a little later on. So you should have links to that if you need them. So again, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.